Chapter 1011 Declan The already tense and murderous battlefield erupted in an instant. The ground rumbled as the giant and majestic body of the magical golem dragon approached, one step at a time. Complex expressions appeared on the faces of the Fobre's adepts, frustration, regret, and even annoyance, but never fear. Grim's eyes swept across the battlefield and instantly took in the expressions of the tens of thousands of creatures there. He realized something and spoke out loud, Lord Declan, why not show yourself and let us meet if you are already here? The seven third grade Fobre's adepts paused for a moment when they heard this. An expression of disbelief then appeared on their faces. Adept Sam's face turned dark as he asked with a chilling tone, how did you know that Lord Declan had already arrived? No wonder Zam was shocked and stunned by Grim's words. Even he had only received news of Adept Declan's arrival seven minutes ago. He couldn't help but be surprised when Grim so quickly revealed the truth. Grim smiled but did not answer the question. Just as Zam intended to continue his threats, a rough and booming voice rang out on the battlefield. There's nothing strange about it. They have a fourth grade golem in their army, and you all remain as fearless as before. Obviously, that's because this old man is here. Is there even a need to guess how he figured it out? HMPH. Bunch of idiots. A figure of average height appeared on the wooden ship. The person did not cast any spells or rely on any items as he walked into the sky above the battlefield step by step. He was a muscular middle-aged man with a stout stature. He had a full beard on his face, with an almost completely bald head. There were only three braids of interweaving black and white running down the back of his head. He was not dressed in the robes that most adepts typically wore. Instead, he wore old and ancient-looking grey leather armour. Not a single trace of magical equipment could be seen on his entire person. He looked to be only forty to fifty years of age, but that extraordinarily concentrated and overwhelming elementium flux around his body signaled his true identity. The power he radiated was extremely strange. It was formed from the refinement and concentration of a mix between extreme physical strength and elementium energy. It was firm, yet contained, all while possessing the activity and impulsiveness unique to wind elementium. In particular, when the middle-aged man looked across the sky at Grim, Grim felt the fires around him stall for a fleeting instant and become tamer and docile. Grim narrowed his eyes to relieve the pain brought about by the excessively bright light that the opponent's aura gave off. The chip was working at full capacity, but all of the scans only revealed extremely chaotic and nonsensical numbers. The light seen through his elementium sight was also useless as it was almost like staring into the sun at close distance. It was incredibly fortunate that his eyes didn't go blind from the piercing light. Grim immediately shut down most of the chip's probing abilities before he could get used to that constant flux of power that the enemy was radiating. Otherwise, the only thing he would see in his field of vision would always be a blinding blood-red light. You are Grim? Hem? Didn't they say that you are only a third-grade fire adept that had only recently advanced? Why do you have the power of an advanced third grade already? The middle-aged man glanced at Grim in confusion, a trace of surprise in his eyes. Even though beginner third grade and advanced third grade were both gnats that could be squished to death with a single finger in his eyes, Grim's ability to advance by two minor grades in such a short time span was sufficient proof of his potential. Provoking such a talented enemy for the clan with no proper reason was such a terrible idea that even fourth-grade body-refining adept Declan couldn't help but start regretting his decision. Damned hag! I knew she had no good introductions to make. It's about time to make that hag pay a price once I kill this quickly improving third-grade fire adept. With a trace of a foul mood in his heart, Murderous intent started to burst forth from his gaze towards Grim. The tiny crimson clan had never been enough to catch his gaze, but he definitely could not allow this third grade fire adept to escape. If he managed to escape and advance to fourth grade in the future, 
then the Fobre's clan would face a calamity. Perhaps sensing the terrifying pressure coming from the fourth grade adept, Graham's body started to hover backward slightly. The fourth grade magical golem dragon of the Crimson Clan hastened its steps, rumbling to the front lines and appearing in front of Green. This is what you are counting on. A metal golem with the power of a fourth grade. Declan stared coldly, not stopping the magical golem dragon from reaching Green. At any rate, he had already firmly locked onto Green's mental flux, he wasn't concerned about Green taking the opportunity to flee. He very charismatically waited for the enemy to make their combat preparations. Brat, let me tell you a secret. If and when you truly have the opportunity to advance to fourth grade, you will naturally know that even the most powerful of auxiliary forces cannot compare to one's own strength. Just like this, break. At this, Adept Declan shouted loudly, and his not particularly muscular right arm silently expanded to twice its original size punching towards the gigantic golem dragon. The fist wasn't of astronomical size, nor did the punch itself appear to be very fast or ferocious. However, driven by the incomparable and seemingly divine strength behind it, the punch possessed tremendous power. The initially formless and shapeless wind elementium in the air was compressed around the punch by tremendous strength as the fist shot forward, gathering into a semi-translucent projection of a fist. As Declan shouted and punched forward, the fist projection glowed with blinding light and shot towards the golem dragon's metallic head. A deafening and inexplicable screech rang throughout the battlefield. The fist projection flew across the air rapidly, all while absorbing the wandering wind elementum in the surroundings into itself like a whale taking in water. When the fist smashed through the air and arrived at the magical golem dragon, the mighty power contained within the blow had risen to a level where even Green was terrified. 1,100 points. A casual and straightforward fist from Declan had over 1,100 points of power. The magical golem dragon was indeed a fourth-grade war machine. The magical goblins operating it from within had also managed to achieve perfect compatibility with it over all these years. The metal shell on the dragon's back flipped over revealing a series of magic energy cannons within. A barrage of cannon fire started to bombard the approaching fist. However, the fist projection had far more concentrated power. It shattered the countless energy fireballs and arrived in front of the magical golem dragon. The golem dragon opened its large mouth, and a gigantic energy pillar, as thick as a well, cut through the sky and blasted against the fist. Finally, it managed to destroy the fist when it was just five meters away. The scattered tide of energy ravaged the air and created a halo-shaped pillar of dust that extended 34 meters into the sky, pushing everything away. Where the massive pillar of dust pushed across, even the magical machines could not stand still. Despite weighing several tons, they were blown off the ground and blasted several hundred meters away. Even the goblin chariots were caught in the blast and were swept into the distance. For a moment, the Crimson Clan's entire formation descended into chaos. However, such a shockwave did not spare the Fobre's forces either. The Fobre's adept forces erected massive barriers of light in the face of this violent energy tide and protected themselves within. However, judging from the flickering light of the wall, they were only barely hanging on. Meanwhile, the subordinate armies, who were not protected by any sort of magical barrier, launched into the sky, screaming before they were slammed heavily into the ground once again. If it weren't for their sturdy physiques, the shockwave alone would have killed many of them. It wasn't just the Crimson Clan. Even the Fobre's clan was scrambling to deal with the shockwave. Hem. This metal golem is pretty interesting. Well then, let me show you the true power of a fourth grade. Having said that, Declan curled a single finger and flicked it. The nail-sized ball of compressed wind then shot towards Greem like a speeding bullet. Greem had now flown onto the head of the golem dragon. He had just landed on the small platform between the curved horns when he felt danger approaching. 
In a single breath, a series of inferno shields and two lava shields shot out of his body and appeared in front of him. Poo poo poo. After a series of frightening thuds, four of the inferno shields were blasted into shreds and scattered into the air sparks. A small hole had also bored through the lava shield made of magma and lava. Finally, the bullet of compressed wind dissipated along with the fifth inferno shield, sparing Green the humiliation of being injured at the very start of the fight. Green felt a chill run down his back when he looked at the last three inferno shields in front of him. There was no longer any concealing the shock on his face and in his heart. Seemingly as if it had sensed Green's intentions, the magical golem dragon roared and a nearly transparent force field appeared from within its body to shield both itself and Green. Green stood firmly on the platform and lifted his head to look at Declan, who was charging down at him. Several pieces of magical equipment radiating powerful auras slowly began to appear on Green. Sodent's holy ring, the magical crown burning sun, the magical armband emblem of fire, the belt the fearless, the boots of ash, the pendant fire dragon's breath, the ghost scepter, and the holy temple ring. He had obtained the ghost scepter from Sionic Benija. It allowed the owner to turn their body into an ethereal form, thereby avoiding physical damage from the real world. The holy temple ring was from a third grade holy knight. It could strengthen the wearer's mental will, allowing them to become immune to all elementum magical damage for five seconds. Green had also obtained a series of other equipment, but no matter how he looked at them, only a few of the pieces were useful to him. One of these pieces of equipment came from the Hunter Adepts and the other from a Holy Knight. When added together, the pieces allowed Green to avoid any single instance of lethal damage perfectly. Chapter 1012 Clash of Blood and Steel the adept forces and subordinate armies that had just been fighting valorously were now all retreating as fast as they could into the distance. Neither the third grades of the Crimson Clan nor the Fobre's clan dared to remain on the battlefield for a moment longer. They quickly commanded the retreat of their armies, leaving ample space for the two terrifying fourth grade powerhouses. The fourth grade magical golem dragon could not be considered a true force to be reckoned within the eyes of the Fobre's adepts in any regard. However, it clearly exhibited tremendous power beyond its actual grade under the mysterious control of that legendary fire adept. As both Declan and the magical golem dragon's preferred style of combat was direct confrontation, waves of dust storms, blown up by the terrifying shockwaves, engulfed the retreating forces before they managed to complete their retreat. Standing in front of the 60-meter-tall and 100-meter-long golem dragon, body-refining adept Declan looked like a sesame seed beside a watermelon. It was hard to see him if one didn't look carefully. Even though he was several dozen times smaller than the magical golem dragon, it was clear that the dragon was the one at a disadvantage through the fists and blows they exchanged. Grim now stood above the golem dragon's head, already taking over all control authority over the dragon from magical goblin Gonga. He did not hide within the golem dragon's body, Grim chose to fight alongside it, lashing at Declan wildly and furiously. One of the dragon's monstrously large metal legs smashed and stomped towards the enemy, inciting howling winds as it did so. Hundreds of magic energy cannons loaded on its back bombed without stop, steadily wearing away at Declan's defensive force field. Of course, Declan was not so foolish as to clash with such a massive metal golem head-on. Instead, he stepped into the air and started to weave between the thick metal legs with his much more agile body. He occasionally stopped here and there, launching a few blows at specific areas of the golem. Every time Declan's outline paused was when he traded blows with the golem dragon. Declan's incredibly vicious compressed wind shots allowed him to knock the golem dragon around without even touching the machine. Meanwhile, the golem dragon would take the opportunity to drown Declan in a torrent of magic energy beams. After a few exchanges, Grim figured out that Declan's elemental affinity was for the wind elementium. However, instead of becoming an elementium adept, he had chosen to use some unique magical technique to combine wind elementium with his body-refining magic. 
Other elementium adepts needed hand signs, chants, and suitable magical materials when they cast spells. However, every single move from Declan was basically a tremendously powerful single-target spell. His attacks didn't just possess incomparably powerful physical force. They possessed terrifying elementium damage as well. More importantly, where and when he put his mind and will was where and when the attack landed. He did not require a buffer time to gather magic and shape spells as Elementium Adepts did. As such, Declan would be able to instantly close in on an ordinary Elementium Adept if they did not have any means of creating distance. When that happened, they would probably die before they could even cast a single large scale spell. Declan might not have muscles as large or well shaped as the low grade body refining adepts but every single punch and kick he used carried horrifying might in them. Grimskin revealed that even a basic attack from Declan, unenhanced by any magic, could achieve damage of over a 1,000 points. The battle techniques that required a brief period of activation would reach 1,600 to 1,700 points of power. Grim couldn't endure a single one of these attacks. Under Grim's command, the hundreds of magic energy cannons tracked Declan as best as they could and constantly unleashing their firepower. The two giant magic energy cannons and the golem dragon's beam were on standby, prepared to unleash a violent blast whenever the enemy was to pause for even a moment. Even Declan's force field would shatter on the spot if the two giant magic energy cannons hit it. Thus, after experiencing the shocking might of the giant cannon once, Declan became incredibly careful. He was scared that he might be hit by all three of the golem dragon's most powerful beams and end up badly injured. After a few tries, Declan resentfully realized that the reason Green was hiding on the platform on the dragon's head was to bait him into attacking. If he wanted to attack Green, then he would unavoidably have to expose himself above the magical golem dragon. When that happened, he would be well within the range of fire for both the giant magic energy cannons and the dragon's energy beam. One slight misstep and even he would be buried beneath the concentrated fire. Having understood Grim's plan, Declan gave up on all thoughts of ending the battle swiftly. Instead, he focused on circling the golem dragon to look for weak spots on its metal body. In particular, he was paying great attention to select regions on the mechanical dragon's form, the exhaust ports, the ventilators, and other similar places. The dragon's shell was truly very hard, but Declan did not believe that its insides were as firmly solid and without weakness. For the sake of discovering these places, Declan swept every single part of the golem dragon's body with shockwaves from his punches. Plenty of fist-marked dents appeared all over the golem dragon's body. Declan also destroyed many of its magic energy cannons. Soon, Declan discovered an entryway in the abdomen of the golem dragon. The entryway was covered in five layers of special metal plates, for a total thickness of two meters. Without any hesitation, Declan endured the rain of cannon fire and the fire adept's powerful spells to charge up to the metal plates. He then started pummeling it with punch after punch. Even the superalloy that had been refined multiple times with secret arcane techniques could not endure the force of Declan's fist. The first plate was quickly smashed and twisted, revealing the second plate beneath. Naturally, Grim would not allow the enemy to so easily break into the dragon's body. As such, the dragon's head curved. It opened its mouth, and a frighteningly thick pillar of energy swept towards Declan. Grim also took this opportunity to chant and cast his spells, sending a massive ball of fire crashing towards the body refining adept. Faced with the enemy's coordinated attacks, Declan quickly reacted. He dodged the dragon's energy attack and chose to simply endure Grim's lava spray, such that he could continue attacking the metal plate. Yet, to his surprise, strange light energy was mixed within Grim's vicious fire attack. The light energy penetrated his defensive force field and left a small scorch mark the size of an egg on the left hand he had used to block with. Even Declan was surprised at this unexpected situation. Having decided to start a war against the Crimson Clan, 
Declan had naturally conducted a very detailed investigation on this legendary fire adept. To be extremely safe, Declan had even made the extra effort to purchase a pendant of fire resistance along with potions of fire resistance. With such preparations, he was confident that the third grade fire adept would not be able to inflict any damage on him through his fire resistance, no matter what spells he had cast. However, the situation here was simply too strange. The lava spray he had cast was a reasonably powerful spell even among third grade spells. However, that was only relative to third grade adepts. That amount of fire damage should not have broken through Declan's defensive force field. Declan dodged the barrage of energy beams and looked down at his hand to examine the scorch mark. He couldn't help but frown. Light attribute energy damage. Moreover, the energy was extraordinarily pure and possessed a strange penetration effect not possessed by other elementum magic. Declan frowned and thought about the situation as he quickly circulated the magical energy in his body. As magic flowed through his left hand, the strange burn mark began to heal and quickly disappeared without a trace. For a body refining adept like himself, his control and refinement over his body had already reached a peak. He did not require any healing spells. All he needed was to expend a little bit of energy and he could recover most damage sustained by his body. Of course, energy healing of this manner could not help with lost limbs. It could only heal lighter surface wounds. As such, Declan had also prepared plenty of healing wands and potions. Metallic creaking rang out as the sound of spinning gears could be heard from the entryway where Declan had attempted to break into. The exposed second layer was quickly shrinking, covered by metal walls sliding in from both sides. In Declan's moment of hesitation, the entryway had vanished completely. The fourth grade body refining adept let out a roar of anger. He evaded most of the attacks from the cannons and arrived at the dragon's thick metal leg, upon which he started attacking aggressively. His fists left twenty centimeter deep craters on the metal. Even the superalloy could not defend against Declan's fists of flesh. They collapsed inwards, the shape of Declan's fist left in the metal. Declan spun around the leg and attacked it wildly, intent on disposing of the dragon's mobility first. Unfortunately, despite trying for a long time, he had no choice but to give up in the end. The golem dragon's body was simply too tough. Even if he were to punch it a hundred times, the best he could do was wear off a thin layer of metal. It was a seven meter thick leg. He would need at least an hour of continuous attacks to be able to break it. The enemy would not give him such plentiful time to do as he wished. From the moment he approached the golem dragon, his defensive force field had been trembling unstoppably from the constant barrage of the cannons. These attacks might not be able to break through his force field, but they drained his stamina quite substantially. Declan had to back away every so often after fighting the golem dragon at close range so that his force field had a buffer time to recover. Chapter 1013 The Power of the Holy Light The battle was still raging on. The armies finally stopped after retreating 10 kilometers. They started to turn back and look upon the dusty battlefield in the distance. Wave after wave of violent magical energies shook the air itself, the result of the purest and most concentrated of magic attacks. One or two thick beams of energy occasionally swept across the horizon, shredding all the clouds in the sky to reveal its strangely crimson color. Shock and disbelief appeared on the faces of Zam and the other six Fobraze adepts as they sensed the intensity of the energy spreading from the distance. That legendary fire adept was actually fighting Lord Declan to a standstill through the use of a fourth grade magical machine. How could they not be shocked and terrified by this? Magical machines were machines, after all. Their massive size might provide them with superior strength, but there was no working around a machine's natural disadvantage of being slow and clumsy. Everyone here should be able to avoid a magical machine's range of attack with some minor technique up their sleeve, before going on to slowly wear down a machine's defense. 
That was why the third grade Fobre's adepts did not think of the fourth grade magical machine as that much of a threat. However, judging from the battle in the distance, Lord Declan did not have too obvious of an advantage in this fight. Everyone was surprised at how powerful the third grade adept was. Of course, if the Fobre's clan had performed a more in-depth investigation and uncovered the past results of the fourth grade magical golem dragon in battle, they wouldn't be so surprised. After all, the fourth grade magical golem dragon had fought against a fourth grade dragon in Lance. Zam, Lord Declan should be able to win, shouldn't he? A male adept asked worriedly. There's no doubt about that. Lord Declan will win. Conviction appeared on adept Zam's face. The third grade adepts instantly calmed down slightly upon hearing this. In truth, at this point in the war, the Fobres no longer had absolute control of the battlefield anymore, even with their massive financial and military reserves. Before fourth grade adepts had appeared on the battlefield, this war had been at the level of a typical adept war. Victory and defeat were very common outcomes for anyone. However, now that the war involved fourth grades, the entire situation was spinning out of control. If Declan did not manage to put down this combination of the 4th grade golem dragon and the 3rd grade legendary fire adept, then everything they had worked for up to this point would have been for naught. So what if they had managed to conquer so many of the Crimson Clan's territories and resources? So what if they had several times the number of low and intermediate grade adepts compared to their opponents? Nothing mattered if they could not take down the 4th grade golem dragon and the 3rd grade fire adept. The true measure of these two clans' strength wasn't in some tiny and trivial numbers, but the personal prowess of the adepts that stood at the peak of the clan. If and when a 4th grade adept wanted to establish his clan or build his kingdom, there would be plenty of organizations and human nations who would fight for the chance to join them. The fourth grade adept wouldn't even need to worry about the trivial administrative tasks, someone would volunteer to do it for them. No organization or force in the world of adepts dared to go against the will of a fourth grade adept. The only one who could interfere or intervene with the will of a fourth grade adept was another fourth grade adept or a military force equal to them. The fourth grade golem dragon of the Crimson Clan had never experienced live pressure testing in combat in the world of adepts, after all. As such, it had not yet been accepted by the various adept clans of Genterim as a genuine fourth grade. Thus, when the fires of war finally reached the Crimson Clan's land of origin, the most potent forces of the two clans finally clashed. The fourth grade magical golem dragon was not complete without green. It might be able to endure the quick and vicious attacks of a fourth grade dragon or ravage a battlefield uncontested. However, it could not stop a powerful fourth grade body refining adept from sneaking in through the gaps in its body and taking it apart from the inside. Green's presence compensated for its only weakness. With Green controlling the giant magic energy cannons and the energy beam along with his own powerful fire spells and holy light damage, 4th grade Declan was tremendously restricted in his movements and actions. He could no longer move around as he pleased. The golem dragon's body was also sufficiently hard and tough. It didn't just manifest in the actual hardness of the superalloy, but in the assimilation of the magical energy from within its body. Without the infusion of magical energy, the superalloy alone wouldn't be hard enough to endure the violent strength of a 4th grade body refining adept. It was because magic energy had seeped into every corner and inch of the magical golem dragon's body that much of the force from Declan's vicious strikes was neutralized. Only the remaining impact could affect the golem dragon's body, leaving behind fearsome dents in the metal. Otherwise, the magical golem dragon would not have been able to stop Declan from taking it apart and boring straight through, even if its metal body was ten times as thick and substantial. His offense having been thwarted, Declan's defenses also started to show holes in them. Even though they were both fourth grade, Declan was far, far smaller than the magical golem dragon. As such, the golem dragon's base strength was a lot higher than Declan's. 
That said, with its clumsy size and unbearable speed, it required incredible coordination to hit Declan with its metal legs or its vicious head. Fortunately, Grim relied on the giant magic energy cannons to make up for the golem dragon's defensive weakness. He chased Declan around with the thick energy beams, forcing him to run and circle around with no time to break through the golem dragon's defenses. After several attempts, Grim stopped using his fire spells altogether. Instead, he converted all his fire energy into corresponding holy light power through Sodent's holy ring. He then used the speed and penetration ability of the pure light energy to bully the fourth grade adept. Light could not be stopped. It could penetrate the defensive force field formed by a fourth grade adept's tremendous personal strength, directly inflicting a strange magical effect on his body akin to a burn. Declan had never even heard of such an attack. He was remarkably unused to dealing with it, especially given his preference for head on confrontations. Since the golem dragon's body was impenetrable and its legs could not be broken, Declan gave up on this pointless strategy and focused on taking down the third grade fire adept. There was no doubt that the legendary fire adept was the weakest link in this chain. It was also the only weakness that Declan could hope to exploit. He didn't believe that a third grade fire adept would be able to defend against the wild melee attacks of a fourth grade body refining adept with just the protection of a defensive force field from the golem dragon. Of course, this change in target also meant that Declan now had to face the attacks of all three energy beams at once. However, his defensive force field was durable enough that a single hit would only cause it to tremble violently. It was only at risk of shattering when two beams hit him simultaneously. Once Declan lost his defensive force field, he would have to quickly avoid all the other incoming attacks and adjust the energy circulation within his body to resummon the force field. Declan would have to endure hundreds of rounds of continuous fire from the smaller magic energy cannons throughout this process, as well as the incredibly unusual light energy attacks of the wicked fire adept. Thus, even though the magical golem dragon was now covered in dents all over its body, three to five visible injuries could also be seen on Declan's body. The most severe of the injuries was located beneath his right rib. It was a terrifying wound that had been left behind by the third energy beam grazing his body after the first two beams had shattered his force field. That one attack had shaved away a bowl-sized piece of flesh from Declan's body. The exposed flesh had crystallized completely, with traces of magical energy still lingering on it. Healing this wound had caused Declan to lose even more of his stamina. After neutralizing the magical energy that remained in his injury with his powers, the flesh and muscles near the wound could finally squirm and mesh together once again under the effect of his formidable physique, uninterrupted by any foreign force. The other injuries were all inflicted by that third-grade fire adept and his light energy. To save stamina, Declan did not waste any power to heal these wounds. Instead, he relied on his 46 points of physique to let them heal on their own. It was 46 points of physique. What a horrifyingly powerful body! Take the common beast of the black forest, the hairy rhinoceros. Even that beast, which was known for its defense, only had 7 points of physique. An ordinary dragon mostly had between 11 to 25 points of physique. The effect of extremely high physique was astounding defensive power and impressive regeneration. With Declan's 46 points of physique, he could stand there and let the enemy attack him all they wanted to, any weapon below third grade would not even be able to leave a scratch. He could put his hand into the mouth of a first grade dragon, and no matter what they did, they would not be able to cause any serious injuries. Of course, to achieve this tremendous defensive effect, Declan still needed to have plenty of stamina and excellent elementum powers. After all, his defensive force field was formed out of extreme life force and wind elementum energy. Neither could be missing from the equation. Unfortunately, such a dominant defense seemed to have no effect on that strange light energy at all. Beam after beam of fast and fearsome holy light landed on Declan's body, leaving imprints that resembled horrible burn marks. 
If Declan did not dodge in time, the pure, holy light could even penetrate his body to purify and neutralize his precious magic energy. Declan's precious magic energy was the driving source of his prowess in battle. Chapter 1014 On the Stage and Behind the Scenes Genterim Curselin Castle a varied group of adepts was gathered in a quiet and mysterious room. Their eyes were fixed upon the radiant magical mirror on the meeting table. The images within the mirror shifted and morphed as it radiated magic energy. On display was the earth-shaking adept clan war taking place outside of Pinecone City. These adepts chattered amongst themselves in boredom while the Crimson Clan's magical machine army and the Fobre's clan's subordinate armies tore each other to bloody pieces as if the dozens of lives being lost on the battlefield wasn't even worthy of their attention. It wasn't until the most powerful forces of both clan appeared, and the battle between the fourth-grade body-refining adept and the fourth-grade magical golem controlled by the third-grade fire adept, that these fire adepts finally pulled themselves together and seriously paid attention to the battle. It's said that the Crimson Clan has been hoarding a goblin plane full of metal reserves. It seems like that's true. A male adept with a grim face spoke out in admiration as he watched the hill-sized metal golem, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to find this much magical alloy, even if they were to empty the entire Aelovis region. Who would have thought that a third-grade adept could last this long at Declan's hands? Declan stepped on a nail this time. A middle-aged female adept with a veil on her face laughed at Declan's misfortune. The other adepts also voiced their opinions and assessment of the battlefield in the distance, but most of them were criticisms and mocking words directed at Declan. As the battle started to increase in intensity, and both parties started to use some of the more impressive techniques up their sleeves, these adepts finally began to assess the third grade fire adept seriously. Can anyone tell what magic it is that the kid is using? Why can his attack penetrate Declan's defensive force field? It isn't very logical, someone finally asked. An elderly adept wearing tortoiseshell glasses who looked like the scholarly type brooded for a moment before speaking, this must be some sort of extremely pure light elementium. It is precisely because it's too pure that the force field has ignored it. It is being treated as naturally occurring magical elementium and, therefore, not isolated outside of the force field. The other adepts took a better look at what was happening, and all agreed with the elderly adept's analysis. Light Elementium It was an extremely niche and unusual natural energy. It was understandable that the force field would treat it as background elementium. If Declan knew that the third-grade fire adept had such a technique, he would definitely have found a way to mitigate light energy damage. He wouldn't so passively endure the third-grade adept's constant attacks. Moreover, the third-grade fire adept's attacks seem to be a bit too powerful. Is that green kid really a third-grade adept? Why is his offensive power so shockingly high? I made a rough calculation. His base attack power has already reached 900 points, and that is a constant output. That seems like it's beyond the range of a third-grade elementium adept. One of the adepts couldn't help but frown and comment. Indeed, the base attack power of most third-grade adepts should only be around 400 points. Even those with elementium specialization can only increase it by another 100 points or so. How did he manage to raise it to 900 points? Doesn't that make him almost equal to us fourth-grade adepts? Someone immediately chimed in. It might be the equipment he's wearing. Some of the things he's wearing look very suspicious, someone else mused. You guys, look carefully at that ring on his right pinky finger. Finally, someone seemed to have discovered something. The point of view of the magical mirror was from top down. At this moment, Green was standing high on the golem dragon's head quickly weaving signs with his hands and chanting spells to guide a beam of white light shooting towards Declan. A mysterious ring with a strange and ancient design on his exposed right hand flickered with an intense magical aura. The adepts could very clearly see that the magical halo radiated by the ring was purple. 
A fourth grade magic ring. It's fourth grade. All the adepts let out a gasp of surprise. It wouldn't be strange if a fourth grade adept owned a fourth grade magic ring. However, when the fourth grade ring was in the hands of a third grade adept, they couldn't help but be amazed. Everyone here knew the difficulty of crafting fourth grade magical equipment. The dozen adepts here might be fourth grade, but the amount of fourth grade magical equipment they each possessed could be counted on a single hand. It couldn't be helped. Crafting magical equipment that was perfectly compatible with their soul origin and affinity was simply far too complicated. Moreover, fourth grade magical equipment would never be so easily given away. Consequently, even though almost every single high-grade adept was a qualified master alchemist, high-grade magical equipment was still in incredibly short supply. Naturally, the fourth-grade adepts were feeling all sorts of emotions now that they had discovered a fourth-grade magical ring in the hands of a third-grade adept. It seems like he got this ring from a foreign plane, and it allows him to convert his magic energy into pure light energy, the old scholar adept couldn't help but elaborate. Apart from conversion, I believe that the ring can also enhance his spells with additional light damage. Otherwise, his base attack power can't be that high, another adept added. Everyone here was a fourth grade adept. They were knowledgeable arcanists with incomparable wisdom. One by one, they gave their analysis and quickly estimated the strange attributes and effects of the fourth grade ring to astounding accuracy. The few hundred points of additional damage provided by the magical ring wasn't much in the eyes of these adepts. However, the ability to convert magic energy into high penetration light energy was incredibly useful. Used at the right time, it could injure an enemy severely at a critical moment in a battle. Greed appeared in the eyes of several of the adepts as they continued to observe the fight. However, at this moment, someone finally interrupted, it seems like the destruction of the Crimson Clan won't be coming to pass. Given so, with what kind of attitude should we be treating this fire adept from now on? For a moment, the adepts fell silent. After a long pause, someone finally spoke. It was an old adept whose beard and hair had all turned white. Judging from the respect given by the other adepts, he was the one with the most authority and was the most senior of them all. Freed, fourth grade adept, chairman of the Gentrim Association. We will decide based on the result of the fight. If Declan wins, we will chase both the fire adept and his crimson clan out of Gentrim. If it's a draw, we will hand over the entirety of Alovis to him. And if he wins? Someone couldn't help but pursue the question. Is that possible? Freed said casually, don't forget. Declan advanced over 700 years ago. There's no way he will be defeated. I'm just saying if. If that fire adept really manages to defeat Declan, I suggest we give him the status and authority of a fourth grade adept while recruiting him into the association. No, I object. A sinister and dry male voice rang out. The adepts turned to look and realized that it was Malton Fire City Lord Alfred that had spoken up. Why, Alfred? Do you bear a grudge against the kid as well? Someone asked in surprise. HMPH. There was another worldly beast invasion in my Molten Fire City a few dozen years ago. This fire adept participated in the extermination as outside help, and I didn't know much about the brat back then. Now, it seems like that beast invasion from before was his handiwork. If he wants to join the association, we will have to settle that score first. Alfred grunted unamusedly and gave a few words of explanation. Then, does anyone else object to the fire adept joining the association? Chairman Freed started to look around the room. I object as well. It was the elderly scholar adept who spoke this time. Matthew, I didn't expect it to be you. Freed couldn't help but pause for a moment. I am not objecting on my own behalf, but on behalf of the Sarubo clan. They gave me quite a lot of resources, so I have no choice but to step forward and object for them. 
Adept Matthew did not hide anything and simply explained everything with a smile on his face. Very well, since people are opposed to it, then the matter of recruiting the fire adept into the association will be put aside for the moment. We will see if he can advance to fourth grade first. While the adepts engaged in their discussion, some unexpected changes occurred in the image within the magical mirror. The battle outside Pinecone City was still going on. An exceptionally handsome hunting eagle was soaring high above the skies, hidden above the thick layers of clouds. Beneath the eagles was the battlefield where the two fourth grades were fighting viciously. If the hunting eagle were an ordinary magical creature, it would already have fled far away upon sensing the waves of horrifying magical flocks. It would not stay in such a dangerous place. The hunting eagle clasped a magical crystal between its two sharp claws, pointing it straight down at the battlefield. Under its gaze, this three-hour-long battle was finally nearing its conclusion. Adept Declan was actually on the verge of being defeated. Indeed, faced with the powerful combination of the third-grade fire adept and the fourth-grade magical golem dragon, fourth-grade body-refining adept Declan was running out of steam to continue the fight. The main reason for his extreme exhaustion was that strange white light being that the legendary fire adept kept shooting out. Every time Declan was hit by the white light, his flesh would be burned while a portion of his magic energy was also burned away. Declan had attempted to take Grim out several times, but the chip support systems always captured his movements. Grim would then gather the three energy beams and blast them at Declan. Even with his outstanding physique, Declan could not endure energy attacks of such intensity and constantly had to back off with injuries. For the sake of healing these injuries, Declan had no choice but to expend a significant amount of his magic energy. Chapter 1015 Fobrae's Defeated In all his time as a fourth grade, Declan had honestly never found himself in such a situation where his stamina had been nearly exhausted by the enemy. He was a body-refining adept, after all. His trained body of flesh and bone had already been refined into a formidable existence comparable to magical equipment. Incredibly powerful physical defense and unimaginable regenerative powers made Declan one of the most challenging body-refining adepts in Gentrim to deal with. How could his stamina be exhausted? Such a suggestion was usually no more than a joke. However, such a ridiculous thing had happened today. After finishing all the healing potions he owned, using up all the spells in the healing wands, and exhausting all the magic energy in his body, Declan was finally worn out. However, the third grade fire adept and the fourth grade golem dragon he piloted were both still as vigorous as ever. It almost seemed like there was an unending supply of magic energy supporting them in combat. That was what Declan simply couldn't comprehend. To his understanding, any metallic magical machine required magic energy to function. If they ran out of magical power, the magical machines would turn into unmoving piles of metal and lose all combatability. Thus, even though most adept clans had metallic golems of their own, the golems were only used to defend adept towers, mystic realms, and other vital facilities. The cost of operating these golems anywhere beyond an adept tower would be enough to cause most adepts to go bankrupt. Meanwhile, this colossus dragon in front of him was huge and bulky. It had to be continually consuming a shockingly high amount of magical energy. How was it that the Crimson Clan was keeping it running? They couldn't possibly have filled the entirety of the dragon's insides with magic crystals, could they? It had been a battle of such intensity, firing hundreds of magic energy cannons without stopping along with three fearsome giant magic energy cannons, all of that had to be supported by a mountain of magic energy. Yet, even though Declan, a fourth-grade body-refining adept, had been completely exhausted, this magical golem dragon was still as mighty as before. It, it was unthinkable. Halfway through the battle, when Declan finally realized he could wear out the golem dragon's energy supply, his own reserves had already been depleted to a concerning level. As such, he had no choice but to take the risk of attacking the third-grade fire adept. 
Unfortunately, the fire adept always seemed to be able to assess and predict his intentions in battle. Every time he advanced to a position where he could attack the fire adept, three thick energy beams would already be waiting for him. Declan had to dodge with all his power to avoid being hit by them. That often meant giving up on the opportunity to attack. With an endless supply of magic energy at his fingertips, the third grade fire adept could freely bombard any location where Declan could threaten him, drowning the body refining adept in an endless sea of cannon fire. Dripping water can cut stone, and even rope can fell a tree. Declan had ignored this barrage of cannon fire initially, then started to avoid them as best he could when his strength began to falter. When all of his energy was exhausted, he could only clumsily stumble around to dodge the energy beams. He finally realized that his biggest mistake was not destroying these smaller cannons as soon as possible. By the end of the battle, with his depleted energy supply, there was no way he could take apart these cannons while they were protected by the three primary energy beams and the fire adept's strange magic. As Declan's energy reserves ran out, the role of both parties in the battle started to undergo some interesting changes. At the start of the battle, Declan had been the hunter with the absolute advantage. His only point of concern had been how to deal with the prickly boar he was fighting against. His choice was to circle repeatedly in an attempt to find a weakness to exploit. At the end of the battle, Declan's stamina was running out. He could no longer charge and dash as ferociously as before, nor move around while dodging as quickly as before. Meanwhile, Grim and the Golem Dragon became exceedingly active near the conclusion of the battle. They started to chase after Declan, desperately trading blows with him to further increase his exhaustion. At this point, Declan had become the prey, and Grim and the Golem Dragon the hunters. Their positions had been reversed. It was the ridiculous scene that the eagle flying above the sky was witnessing. Of course, everything that the eagle saw was transmitted back to Kersling Castle, shocking all of the scrying fourth grade adepts. What a humiliation. Failure. Declan's making us all look like fools. The furious and angry shouts were so loud they almost threatened to shatter the magical barriers around the room and shake the castle itself. However, after a brief period of fury, the fourth grade adepts remembered Declan's current situation. They couldn't help but feel immense sympathy for him. The dominating move to exterminate the Crimson Clan was most certainly not Declan's own idea. Instead, it was an order given out by the great adept of the Fobre's clan from the realms beyond. It was said that the ancestor of the Fobre's clan had only given such an order at the request of another great adept. Obviously, this order had now put Declan in a horrible situation. If he retreated from the battlefield in defeat, then the third great adept would most definitely drive the fourth great golem dragon towards the Fobre's forces and slaughter the lot of them. The high-grade adepts might be able to escape successfully, but the majority of their adept forces and the subordinate army would be done for. It would be a vicious strike that was enough to inflict a terrible blow to the Fobre's clan, even with their wealth and prosperity. Chairman Freed's voice immediately rang out in the room. Elder Nicholas, your clan's territory is the closest to Elovis. Send a party to rescue the elites of the Fobre's clan. Remember, do not incite any more conflict or cause any more confrontations with that fire adept. Saving people is the priority. Kerala, inform Loron of Rhine City to immediately contact the Crimson Clan. Tell them that the association has approved of their rule over Elovis. This clan war has also ended in the defeat of the Fobre's clan. All the losses that the Crimson Clan has suffered during the war will be compensated ten times over even a hundred times by the Fobre's clan, and request that they do not slaughter the Fobre's adepts and apprentices recklessly. They are free to do as they please with the worldly soldiers and subordinate armies. A series of orders were quickly relayed. Several adepts nodded, and their bodies exploded into black mist, vanishing from the room. As it turned out, their bodies in Kersling Castle were illusions formed out of projection spells. 
their actual persons were still in their own rooms in their adept towers. In the blink of an eye, most of the fourth grade adepts in the room had disappeared. Only Chairman Freed and Elder Merva remained. There was a heavy frown on the chairman's face. They had attended the meeting in person. What do you think about what happened today? Chairman Freed suddenly said. If my estimation is not wrong, that fire adept known as Grim has over a 40% chance to advance to fourth grade. A person like this, we should try and recruit and get on our side. Elder Merva thought for a moment before replying. But Matthew and Alfred, Freed couldn't help but brood. HMPH. Their opinions mean nothing. I heard that the Crimson Clan's development in the Northern Lands has not been going well. Even though they have made allies out of the Fate Witches, they are not welcomed by the other witch branches. They also broke out into a war with the Cold Winter Witches not long ago, it said that the Cold Winter Witches were the ones who lost. It's truly unbelievable. Oh, there was such a thing. As the chairman of the Genturim Association, Freed controlled the adept forces in the entirety of the continent's central region. The daily tasks he had to manage had taken up most of his time. Naturally, he could not pay any extra attention to the conflicts between the witch branches of the northern lands. That said, since this matter concerned the Crimson Clan, he had no choice but to find out more. Send some people to perform an in-depth investigation of the relation between Grim and the Fate Witches. If he isn't a spy planted by the Northern Lands in the Central Region, we can consider recruiting him into the Association. Cough. It's been over 200 years since we had a new face in the Genturim Association, hasn't it? It's about time for us to inject some fresh blood into the system. As the two higher-ups of the Genturim Association left the room, the place once again returned to ghostly silence. How could the adepts and apprentices of the Fobre's clan possibly know that their fates had already been decided by several fourth-grade adepts tens of thousands of kilometers away, in a matter of a few sentences? When adept Declan's stamina reached an incredibly dangerous level, he finally abandoned all his dignity and glory as a fourth-grade adept. He turned to flee. The tens of thousands of adepts, apprentices, warriors, and soldiers who witnessed this scene were stunned. By the time they realized something was wrong, the overjoyed crimson adepts were already charging over at the lead of their magical machine army. The same two armies, the same vicious warriors, but when the position of attacker and defender switched about, their mentalities changed entirely. The Fobre's clan were the ones on the offense earlier, while the Crimson clan had been on the defense. Now the Crimson clan were the ones on offense, and the Fobre's corn were the ones on defense. When the gigantic golem dragon stormed forward with an army of magical machines in tow, the adepts of the Fobre's clan had yet to break free from their utter shock and horror. By the time they understood the situation, a torrent of magic energy fireballs and the energy beams of the golem dragon had already fallen on their position. Adepts and apprentices alike were blown to bloody bits in the earth-shaking tide of magic energy. Pieces of flesh and bone splattered everywhere. The adept force that had lost their will to resist weakly retaliated with two volleys of attacks before quickly abandoning the formation and fleeing into the distance. The subordinate armies and the worldly soldiers were all left behind to intercept the pursuers from the Crimson Clan. Thus, a chaotic melee broke out as one party chased after the other, spreading the flames of war to further and further territories. At the same time, news of the Fobre's clan's defeat spread in every direction like a plague. Chapter 1016 The Situation Changes The Fobre's clan had been defeated. The pursuit on the battlefield continued, but news was already spreading out like a plague. Every person and organization that heard of this news couldn't believe their ears and scrambled to confirm the validity of it. By the time they obtained confirmation through their various means, time was no longer in their hands. Elovis was now a chaotic battlefield, as well as a giant vortex. It was dragging all the adept organizations and forces around it into the fray of battle. 
The Crimson Clan's rampant expansion and invasions over the years had driven away all the adept organizations in Elovis. When the clan war broke out, these defeated forces and opportunists came out of the cracks, spurred by the might of the Fobre's clan. They became supporters of the Fobre's clan, shouting in favor of them and traveling everywhere to get former Crimson forces to surrender. The Fobre's clan was not opposed to this uninvited alliance either. After all, the Fobre's forces needed to be concentrated in a single place before they defeated the Crimson clan. They could not afford to send soldiers all over Elovis to maintain order. As such, the Fobre's adepts chose to simply turn a blind eye to these scavenging vultures trying to make some profit by raiding resource sites while the two adept clans fought. At any rate, once the Crimson Clan was defeated, ownership of all the territories and resource sites they had obtained would be transferred to the Fobre's clan without exception. A few people taking a little advantage of the situation to gather some resources while the war was going on wouldn't hurt their final profits too much. Thus, while the Fobre's forces were having their final showdown against the Crimson Clan outside Pinecone City, the adept organizations and clans that had reached their dirty hands into Elovis were enjoying the feast of their lives, freely exploiting and raiding everything that once belonged to the Crimson Clan. Perhaps the name of the Fobre's clan had given them the illusion of inevitability. Still, it caused them to abandon their much-required cautiousness, and they did not pay close attention to the final battle that would decide the fate of Elovis. Consequently, 4th grade adept Declan abandoned the battlefield and fled while the Fobre's elite forces left behind the Voodoo Beast Army, the Modified Beast Army, the Subordinate Armies, and the other soldiers to retreat the battlefield rapidly spread outwards in every direction. A top-tier adept could instantly decide the outcome of the battlefield. Even though the elites of the Fobre's clan were still present, and even though the Fobre's clan's overall military strength was still several times that of the Crimson clans, all of it became an illusory bubble when their greatest fighting force was defeated. Everyone began to flee. The adepts that owned magical flying beasts summoned their steeds and escaped the battlefield as quickly as they could. The rest of the elites took out the best of their abilities to escape pursuit as well, they no longer tried to fight against the Crimson forces and instead started running to the border of Elovis. Naturally, the subordinate forces had no such discipline or ability. They were quickly routed after a few assaults by the Crimson magical machines. These individuals had been recruited from all sorts of places and had many peculiar abilities. Some summoned magical beasts as their mounts to run, while some turned into ravens, deer, and rats to hide. Some used their innate abilities to hide in towns or villages while others simply crouched down and surrendered. Faced with this swarm of ants that had just had their nests destroyed, the Crimson Clan decided not to spread their forces to capture them all. Instead, they concentrated their soldiers and chased after the few, still composed, elites of the Fobre's clan. If someone were to look down upon Elovis from high in the sky, they would find that the Fobre's elites were fighting as they fled, trying their best to reach the border. Meanwhile, the main forces of the Crimson clan were using the motherships, goblin chariots, and other vehicles to travel to important mountain passes to intercept the enemy. As the two parties engaged in the chase, the battlefield spread to every corner of Elovis. While the web of war was cast across the entire region of Elovis, all of the opportunists and fence sitters that did not belong to the Fobre's clan, those only here to net a profit and scavenge for goods, found themselves in trouble. By the time they realized something was wrong and tried to leave, all the principal roads and mountain passes around them had become fiercely contested regions that the Fobre's clan and Crimson clan were viciously fighting over. Meanwhile, these fence-sitters were like pathetic bugs caught between two raging elephants. They no longer had the chance to escape and survive unscathed. These opportunists had brazenly trespassed into Crimson clan territory its and resource sites, chasing away or imprisoning the adepts and apprentices that the Crimson Clan had stationed here before rampantly robbing the places of their resources and wealth. However, while they were enjoying this rare and sumptuous feast in high spirits, the situation around them took a terrible turn. 
The entire region of Elovis had become a bloody battlefield where one clan chased after the other. These small adept organizations and forces that had placed the wrong bets were caught in between now. They were as anxious as ants on a hot pan, desperately searching for the opportunity to escape. Unfortunately, these two clans had gone berserk in their attempts to chase and escape. No one had the time to investigate the validity and actual factions of these allied forces. Any outside force with no clear affiliation had only one outcome if they ran into the two clans' death. Several parties sent out by the surrounding small adept organizations were murdered and exterminated by the two clans. Of course, the leaders of some of these organizations were smart enough to save themselves. They immediately let out the imprisoned crimson adepts and apprentices and treated them to good food and service while promising grand compensations to the crimson clan. In doing so, they barely managed to whitewash themselves into allies of the crimson clan. What could you say? These fence-sitters and opportunists were just that shameless. After covering for themselves, they quickly waved their flags and joined the Crimson Clan, becoming the most passionate group of people chasing after the Fobre's clan. While the forces of the two powerful clans engaged in difficult battles all across Elovis, all sorts of ridiculous and unimagined stories of betrayal and loyalty occurred all over the place. Stone's Hard Valley it was a winding valley caught between two towering mountains and one of the key passes of Elovis, controlling the southwest border. It used to be a fortress territory where the Crimson Clan had stationed forces, but when the clan war broke out, the garrison was recalled, and this place became an abandoned fortress. It was noon when the blue skies suddenly burst with activity. A silver mothership arrived carrying several hundred magical machines with the full intent of taking back control of the fortress. However, just as the 400 magical machines charged down the ship and got into formation to assault the fortress, a grey flag rose from the tallest stone tower of the fortress. The sigil of a bloody spear had been embroidered on the flag with golden thread. This sigil represented a famous name in Gentrim the Dina clan. The one leading the Crimson Magical Machines was Second Grade Blood Knight Shorosh. He saw the Dina clan's banner waving above the fortress and immediately called for the forces to stop. He started to evaluate the location. Perhaps discovering the arrival of the Crimson clan's Magical Machine army, the gates of the outpost opened, and a party of adept forces emerged on magical steeds. The one in the lead was a man. His face was filled with messy cuts and plenty of stitches. At first glance, it almost looked like his face had been diced up and bound together with cured and simple rope. Shorosh heart sank. The monster leading the Dina forces was a third-grade adept. The scar-faced adept rode up to the crimson magical machines and looked down upon Shorosh on his horse. Even as a vampire, Shorosh felt a chill run down his spine when the adept stared at him with his murky, pupil-less eyeballs. I am Gallo of the Dina clan. In accordance with Lord Kerala's orders, I am here to make an announcement. Your war with the Fobre's clan cannot cross the borders. It must be restricted to the Elovis region. If any side is to break this rule, we of the Dina clan have the right to correct them. Shorosh Crimson eyes flickered as he protested, Sir, this valley is our clan's asset to begin with. No longer. Scarface adept Gallo coldly said, For the sake of supervising and enforcing this rule, we have temporarily confiscated this valley and outpost. Naturally, we will return it to you once the war resolves. You may leave now. As adept Gallo explicitly threatened Shorosh, the hundreds of clan soldiers behind him slowly pushed forward. Judging from the aura and energy intensity they were radiating, this was an adept force with powerful fighting ability. None of them might be an actual adept, but strengthened by their magical steeds and their mysterious armor, they could exhibit fighting power equal to an adept. Moreover, the ones leading the force were a third-grade adept and five second-grade adepts. An army with this much power would have no problem tearing through the Crimson Clan's 400 magical machines. 
Shorosh's face twitched a few times, but after some quick thinking, he finally waved his hand and signaled for the magical machines to retreat several hundred meters away. He then quickly contacted the Crimson leadership. However, just as they were waiting for orders from above, a large army of defeated Fobre's forces swarmed from a distance. Shorosh was about to lead the machines to intercept them, but the Dina clan squad of magical steeds stood in front of them and blocked their path forward. Lord Gallo, what does this mean? Shorosh couldn't help but scowl. Exercising our duty to supervise the battlefield. You are free to do as you please. Shorosh nose almost went crooked from anger when he heard the opponent's casual and relaxed answer. All right, you got us. Chapter 1017 Sweet Sleep Pinecone City Mothership Gargamel shut off the communication furiously, stood up, and left the command hall. He walked through a long metal corridor and arrived in front of the entrance of a secret room. Deng. 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 After a few light knocks, the metallic doors opened, sliding silently into the walls. Green was naked from the waist up in the room, Mary and Alice carefully treating the wounds on his body. What matter do you have to report now? Do you not know that the clan leader is currently receiving treatment? Mary frowned and reprimanded with a scowl on her face. Gargamel smiled awkwardly. Speak, what has happened? Grim asked. He could discern many things from Gargamel's expression. All the magical machine squads we sent to the border regions have been intercepted. What? Who dares stand in our way with these circumstances? Who is it? Tell me who is it. I'll go and tear them apart right now. Mary's crimson eyes lit up upon hearing this. She seemed incredibly eager to go. In the southwest is the bloody spear army of the Dina clan, in the northwest is the white ghost army of the Entom clan, and in the south is the swamp flying dragon army of the Banda clan. More armies of other clans are appearing in the other directions as well, and the magical machine squads we sent on pursuit have been intercepted. Only intercepted and sent back, correct? No direct conflict. Green frowned and followed with a question. No. Gargamel shook his head and said, All interfering adept clans have claimed that they are acting on orders of the association and are responsible for supervising the battlefield and potential violations. They did not directly attack our clan's forces. Green thought for a moment and turned to look at Alice. A look appeared on Alice's gentle, pretty face that said she had already anticipated this. She explained to Grim softly, the fact that they didn't initiate a fight means that the association leaders don't want to go to war yet. Intercepting our forces and sending them back is telling us that there's a boundary to our war that we must not cross. Judging by the implication, the association has tacitly consented to our rule over the Elovis region, but we are not allowed to spread the fires of war beyond the region. They say wage war on us, and they wage war on us, they say stop fighting, and we have to stop fighting. HMPH. Those old bastards. Don't they just like to manage everything? Mary's temper was still as fiery as ever, and it was written all over her face. Green sighed and turned to speak to Gargamel, notify all clan adepts that our main target of pursuit is still the Fobre's clan, but we can loosen our chase on the enemies outside of the Fobre's clan. However, execute all enemies that remain within Elovis and refuse to surrender by night time. Yes, sir. Gargamel bowed and acknowledged the order. He was about to step out of the room to relay the instructions, but Grim stopped him. I have already heard Mary speak about everything that has happened in the clan recently. You have done well. You lived up to my expectations. It is only my duty. It is not worthy of my lord's praise. An unconcealable smile appeared on Gargamel's old and sinister face when he heard Green's praise. This time, I also got my hands on some valuable items from the other world. These will be your rewards then. 
Grim took out three strange vials of purple potions from his storage ring and put them in Gargamel's hands. Three potions. One of them is a bloodline recreation potion, while the other two are bloodline purification potions. You might be advanced first grade now, but you're still a long way from peak first grade. With this bloodline recreation potion, you can obtain the bloodline of the giant black mamba. I believe they are also venomous and of the poison attribute, which makes for a decent match with your adept affinities. More importantly, once you turn into a bloodline adept, your lifespan should be extended to some degree. Once you use the two bloodline purification potions, it should be enough for you to advance to second grade. Grim continued to ramble on and warn Gargamel about many other things he needed to be cautious about while using the potion. However, Gargamel was completely stunned now as if he had just been blasted with a bolt of lightning. He could only laugh foolishly while holding the three potions in his arms. No one might know about his situation, but Gargamel clearly knew that he only had eleven years of life left. Ever since he became Grim's majordomo in Gentarim, he had been working day and night for the sake of the Crimson Clan and had almost abandoned his own practice as a potions master. He did not have excellent talent. Becoming a first-grade adept was already the fortune of his lifetime. As such, he had never hoped to advance to second grade. The reason he still worked so hard for Grim and for the Crimson Clan wasn't for his own benefit, but for the sake of his family. He hoped that Grim would treat Eva and his daughter Amelia well on account of his loyal service. Yet now, close to the end of his life, a massive gift had crashed down onto his head from the skies above. Not only would he be able to continue living, but he would also be able to enjoy an even better, healthier life. It, it was incredible news that had shattered his mental state, leaving him reeling and dizzy with disbelief. He had no idea if what was happening in front of him was real or simply a dream. Grim shook his head unamusedly when he saw Gargamel bite the back of his hand and jump up from the pain. I guess I'll go relay the orders. I see Gargamel's gone mad. Gargamel immediately snapped back to reality when he heard Mary speak. He hugged the three potions tightly, almost as if he was hugging the most important thing in his life. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go now. He rushed out of the room. When the door finally closed again, Mary turned and smiled at Green. Seems like you got quite a haul from your trip to the other world. You even prepared a present for that silly adept. What about mine? Mary flashed her incisors while she spoke, as if she would bite down on Green if he said he had no presents. Mary was a third-grade vampire adept now. Even Green would suffer a heavy loss to his spirits if she got to sink her fangs into him. Don't, we can talk with our actions. No need to use our mouths. You just want presents, don't you? I have them, I do. Green hastily took out some tightly sealed clay jars from his storage ring and passed them to Mary. Mary grabbed the jars and looked at them. The mud seals on the jars were carved full of mysterious runes, while the pots themselves, though of seemingly crude handiwork, had a pretty, otherworldly aesthetic. The clay jars were handmade by someone. Due to the haste in making them, their shapes were uneven, and much of the color had faded from their patterns. Mary shook the jars. It was obvious that there was some sort of viscous liquid inside. Her ruby eyes couldn't help but light up. She pierced the mud seal with her sharp finger and dabbed a little of red substance for a taste. She almost screamed from delight. Third grade, this is refined blood from a third grade creature. Are you sure you want to give me all this? Mary was so excited that her eyes gleamed. Green nodded his head. If it wasn't for Mary he wouldn't have needed to spend so much effort to draw a bunch of third-grade gold knights into a trap. That earth-shaking battle had caused Grim, Tess, and Italil to become severely injured. However, the holy knights had ended up in a far worse position. First, they were struck by the magic traps that the witches had hidden beneath the swamp. 
Then, while they were confused by the traps, the three adepts had worked together to take them down, one by one. Under their ferocious and reckless attacks, the seven third grade gold knights were killed in the poison swamps. The blood of the gold knights was extracted, refined, and sealed in these jars. It was all done by witch Tess. Green then took away the holy light souls, leaving the witches only with their tattered corpses. There were people among the deceit witches who excelled at creating voodoo beasts and zombie golems. This number of high-quality holy night corpses was enough for them to create a terrifying squad of voodoo beasts. With the protection of such voodoo beasts, they would be more confident in their safety. Their chances of survival in Henvik would be reasonably good as long as they didn't run into the two fourth great holy knights. As for whether and how they would be rescued. That was the concern of the deceit witches, and Grim couldn't be bothered. Grim had immediately said his farewells with Wichitalil upon returning to the world of adepts. Grim quickly explained everything that had happened to Mary and Alice in a few sentences. Mary immediately and happily went to look for another room to enjoy her snack, leaving Grim and Alice alone. Once they were the only two people left, Grim laughed maliciously and patted his own thighs. Alice rolled her eyes at him unamusedly, before blushing and sitting onto his lap. Grim embraced Alice and put her face into her silky long hair, taking in the light fragrance of her body. He then let out a long sigh, steeped in exhaustion and fatigue. Over the past five years, Grim had been running around the other world and had never gotten proper time to rest and sleep. He had been on alert or fighting with people for every moment in his life. He hadn't even dared to fall asleep while trapped in the volcano. He had instead replaced sleep with meditation. There had been constant fighting and unending injuries. Even though most of Grim's wounds had healed, the accumulated fatigue had been etched deep in his spirit and soul. Moreover, once he returned home, he had to engage in a battle against a fourth grade adept without the time to stop and rest. Even a person forged of metal could not endure such arduous strain. As such, after burying his face in Alice's hair and semi-consciously muttering something to her, Grim fell into sweet, sweet sleep. He fell into an exceedingly deep slumber, and an exceedingly sweet one at that, it was almost as if he had returned to his mother's womb. It was calm, quiet, peaceful, and without worry. Chapter 1018 Fourth Grade Force The war between the two clans concluded after half a year. One side was a large clan led by a fourth grade adept, while the other was a quickly rising clan. Yet, the result of the war was entirely beyond everyone's expectations. It was the Crimson Clan that had managed to defend against the Fobre's clan's repeated assaults, finally obtaining the ultimate victory outside of Pinecone City in a battle between the most powerful adepts of their corresponding sides. The Crimson Clan didn't currently have a fourth grade adept. However, the combination of the third grade adept and the fourth grade magical machine golem dragon was already as mighty as an ordinary fourth grade adept. Moreover, many experienced adepts estimated that the legendary fire adept and founder of the Crimson Clan had a very high chance of advancing to fourth grade. It was undoubtedly incredible information with tremendous implications. Fourth grade. For most planar worlds, this was already the highest limit of power that the plane could contain. Any further increase in power would cause the individual to be restrained and rejected by the planar world. In the end, anyone with excessive power would have no choice but to head to the realms beyond to look for a new place of shelter. Thus, fourth grades were the uncontested emperors within a plane and the so-called deities in the eyes of mortals. When you were only a third grade adept, you would have to work hard and labor tirelessly day and night just to create an organization that belonged to yourself. However, once you advanced to fourth grade, you no longer needed to put in any effort or hard work. Plenty of adept organizations and forces would throw themselves at your feet, crying and begging to become your subordinates. It was the difference between third grade and fourth grade. 
However, this one step between third grade and fourth grade was an exceptionally difficult step to take. The unique ADEPT cultivation system in the world of ADEPTS allowed anyone to join an ADEPT tower to study as long as they had an ADEPT talent. However, depending on the extent of their talent, over 80% of ADEPT apprentices were kept outside the threshold of an ADEPT. Advancing to become an ADEPT was 60% talent and 40% luck. Once an apprentice advanced to become an adept, they would instantly transform from a chicken into a phoenix. They would suddenly rise to a position of power and rule above all else, becoming one of the true masters of the world of adepts. However, this was only relative to the kingdom of mortal humans. Amongst the adepts, first grade adepts were still cannon fodder and individuals to be exploited. Adepts with ambition would fight and struggle at the lowest level of the various adept clans, organizations, and forces, scheming and clashing with each other over small amounts of resources. The competition and risk of elimination in the world of adepts were even more intense, more savage, and carried more profound implications than the schemes and plots between human nobles. The fall of a single adept could result in the collapse of an entire noble family. The rise of an individual adept could mean the creation of a glorious human kingdom. The constant fluctuations of power in human kingdoms and the change in dynasties might seem like a natural result of the development of history. However, at its core, these changes in history were no more than an extension of the changing power dynamics among the adepts. Before the Crimson Clan rose to power, there were seven adept clans and organizations of various sizes in the Elovis region, along with a hundred noble territories. Five human kingdoms also had legacies lasting for several hundreds of years. These various noble territories and the five human kingdoms all belonged to different adept clans and organizations. These were the places that the adept forces scoured for resources and new blood. However, with the conclusion of the war between the Crimson Clan and the Fobres Clan, the human kingdoms and noble territories of Elovis experienced a thorough rearrangement and reforging. Countless noble families that had picked the wrong side during the war were toppled and purged, replaced by lower nobles who had stood unquestioningly by the Crimson Clan side, taking over stretch after stretch of vast and fertile land. There were no longer any other adept clans or organizations throughout Elovis. There was only one voice now, that of the rising sun known as the Crimson Clan. Under such a situation, all the noble territories in Elovis were like shattered bones and minced meat. They were gathered together by a powerful will and started to be rearranged, concentrated, and strengthened. With Fire Throne and Pinecone City at the center, the shape of a vast human kingdom slowly started to form. No actual conflicts happened at the borders. Faced with the fresh elites of the various large clans, the higher-ups of the Crimson Clan managed to retain a cool head despite their victory. They did not attempt to challenge the current order of Gentrum. A large group of the main adept forces of the Fobres Clan managed to escape Elovis thanks to the interference of these foreign forces. However, 60% of their lower-level forces had still been abandoned on the battlefield. Some of them were exterminated by the Crimson Clan, while the others were selectively captured and imprisoned. The Frost Giant army might have been incomparably ferocious while on the offense, but when they were on the run, their massive size and slow speed made them the main targets for the Crimson Clan. Nearly 40% of the Frost Giants died in their attempt to flee. The rest of them had no choice but to surrender under the lead of the two frost giant mags. They were kept in a valley and put under the strict surveillance of the Crimson Clan. Meanwhile, the modified beast army had incredible speed and was able to escape quickly. Unfortunately, they were not familiar with the local geography. Without the guidance of the Fobres adepts, they thrashed about the vast territories of Elovis like lost flies, unsure of where to escape. Once the Crimson Clan cut off all their paths to the outside world, they became birds in a cage. There was nowhere to run. The Crimson Clan had initially intended to make some of the modified beasts submit so that they could conduct research on them. Unfortunately, 
these beasts lack the complete intelligence and consciousness that the frost giants possessed. The combat orders etched deep in their souls made them only obey the commands of certain adepts. There was no way of making them submit at all. A mothership carrying an army of magical machines caught up and thoroughly exterminated every last one of them in a remote plain in the wild. The unique pack of gargoyles had protected the Fobres clan's flying wooden ship and escorted it out of the Elovis region. The Crimson clan had attempted to intercept the gargoyles and take them during this process, but they were foiled by the third grade adepts of the Fobres clan. This unprecedented defeat lasted for five consecutive days and affected the entirety of Elovis. For a moment, Elovis was turned into a massive ruin of war. Ravaged cities, castles, and villas could be seen everywhere, along with oddly shaped corpses, rising smoke, and defiled lands. After exterminating or capturing all Fobre's soldiers that remained in the region, the Crimson Clan spent another two weeks cleaning up the modified beasts and voodoo beasts that had escaped into more remote villages and rural areas. It wasn't until the thirteenth day of the ninth month that the fighting in Elovis finally stopped. This war between the Fobres clan and the Crimson clan ended with the total victory of the Crimson clan. However, the price of victory had also been crushing. Due to the reckless fighting and destruction unleashed by both parties during the war, over seven resource sites had been destroyed, along with a dozen human cities, several hundred castles and villas, and several tens of thousands of tons of food. According to incomplete counts after the war, over 210,000 civilians had died during the war as well. A difference in perspective would cause one to perceive the war with a different attitude. If you were an ordinary civilian, this war would only bring about endless pain and agonizing memories to you and your family. However, if you were a crimson adept that survived the war, you could now party to your delight. That was because they had won the war. Even though the Crimson Clan had suffered colossal losses during this war, the tangible and intangible benefits of obtaining victory were immeasurable. Disregarding everything else, just the Gentrim Association's acknowledgement of the Crimson Clan's rule was invaluable. From now on, Elovis would become the Crimson Clan's private asset. Every resource, territory, civilian, woods, and or reserve found within these lands belonged to the Crimson Clan. It was rare, even for the central region. There were a total of 31 areas of human activity of various sizes in Gentrim. These 31 areas were categorized as individual regions. Each region had a border of sorts that separated them. Hundreds and thousands of powerful adept clans and organizations lived upon this vast land. They were spread across these 31 regions, competing and fighting, all while coexisting with each other. Despite the number of clans and organizations, only fourth-grade forces could claim an entire region for themselves. These so-called fourth-grade forces referred to an organization that possessed a fourth-grade adept. That was the most crucial prerequisite for a clan or organization laying claim to a region of their own. A force that had not been acknowledged by others would not be able to maintain a long and stable rule even if they managed to drive away all competitors with sheer force. The Crimson Clan was the best example. Before this war, they had no fourth-grade adept. They had only owned a fourth-grade war machine that had not yet been pressure-tested in a live adept war. As such, the clan's ruling position was not acknowledged by the people of Gentrim. It wasn't strange that an adept war like this had broken out. Now that the Gentrim Association had recognized the Crimson Clan's rule over the entirety of Elovis, it was an indirect acknowledgement of the Crimson Clan's status as a fourth-grade force. The weight of such status was earth-shaking in the central region. It was important to note that there were no more than 14 fourth-grades throughout Gentrim. Moreover, no new fourth-grade had appeared in Gentrim for several centuries now. According to the research of the more curious busybodies, there were only three adepts among the many third grades who had a significant chance of advancing to fourth grade. Chapter 1019 Clan Banquet Fire Throne 
An exceptionally luxurious and massive celebratory banquet was being held in the lava hall. Hundreds of official adepts belonging to the Crimson Clan were gathered here, all cheer and smiles, toasting and celebrating as they awaited the arrival of the clan higher-ups. The first to arrive was naturally Goblin Sage Snorlax, who possessed the most resources and connections within the clan. Along with him came the commander of the Brutal Blood Army, Drusilla Larsal. Upon arrival, they headed straight to a corner of the hall where they found the leader of the magical goblins, Dean Gonga, as well as Princess Vanessa. They quickly engaged in a lively conversation. If second grade Tigul were also here with them, all five leaders of the Crimson Clan's goblin faction would be gathered in one place. Their discussion mostly revolved around the losses of the goblin faction in the war, how the various goblin merchant groups were to profit from the large-scale reconstruction of buildings in the clan's territory after the war, and other responses to challenges and opportunities from the outside world. That said, privately, most of their attention was still fixed upon the potential rewards from the clan. Through their discreet methods, these goblin leaders already knew that Crimson Majordomo Adept Gargamel, the one who worked the hardest during the war, had already been rewarded by the clan leader. Bloodline Recreation Potion and Bloodline Purification Potions of a Serpentine Adept With these potions, Gargamel would have an 80% chance of successfully advancing to second grade and converting his bloodline talent into that of a noble serpentine bloodline regardless of how terrible his innate talent was. It was no doubt a rebirth for Gargamel, whose lifespan had almost been exhausted already. It would extend his life by another one to two hundred years. The implications behind this caused the goblin leaders to become incredibly envious. Yet, such a reward was something they could only hope for but never actually obtain. After all, Gargamel had worked tirelessly for the Crimson Clan over the past few decades. His contribution was also evident for all to see, a ledger that could not be wiped out by any means. Meanwhile, the other figure of authority in the Crimson Clan, Adept Merrill, was the clan leader's disciple, to begin with. She had also worked hard and remained ever loyal to her teacher. Thus, she had obtained the powerful bloodline of a fire dragon. Naturally, the reason the two of them had been forcefully promoted and strengthened by the clan leader in this manner had much to do with their identities, contributions, and loyalty. Regardless of how envious or jealous the other adepts were, they could only look on helplessly with no means of competing with them. In all honesty, it was also tough to construct a healthy, stable, and long-term system of operation around a core adept who could die at any time due to the exhaustion of their lifespan. Extending Gargamel and Merrill's life would effectively bring stability to the core authority of the Crimson Clan. Increasing their grades and improving their power prevented the awkward situation of the core adepts only being first grade while issuing orders to powerful second and third grade fighters. As authority figures of the clan, second grade would suffice. If they were forcefully strengthened to third grade, it would be an enormous waste of combat power and resources. Of course, Grim had not thought so far into the future nor considered the issue so deeply when he decided to promote his subordinates. The hundreds of years of experience and his vision as a ruler allowed him to handle such matters with ease. Moreover, the Crimson Clan had been created with his own two hands. He represented uncontested authority within the clan. There was no need to think so intensely about every single one of his decisions. He could do anything he wished to do, and it would not end poorly. After all, what determined the might of a clan was its top-tier fighting force. The quantity and quality of low- and intermediate-grade adepts were only the garnish on top. Even if Green were to leave the Crimson Clan, he would still be a feared and respected third-grade legendary fire adept wherever he went. If he wanted to establish a new clan or organization, he would only need to express that desire, and he would easily obtain support exceeding hundreds of years of accumulation for low-grade adepts. Meanwhile, if Green were to leave the Crimson Clan, the clan's power and status would fall in an instant. Even with two other third grades, 
the group would have trouble reaching its current scale and might. The effect of a powerful third-grade adept was something that could not be matched by multiple adepts of the same grade. That was the main reason why Grim was revered with the title of legendary in Gentrum. After spending some time envying Gargamel, the goblins couldn't help but start reflecting on the currently hidden threats within the goblin faction. Much like Gargamel, and with the exception of Princess Vanessa who now possessed the body of a mechanical adept, these goblins all faced the same problem, their short lifespan as goblins. On average, the lifespan of a goblin was only half that of humans. Even though they had been living in luxury over the past few decades and devoured many rare adept resources, they could not change the limits of their lowly goblin bloodline on a fundamental level. Goblin sage Snorlax was doing a bit better than the others. He now walked the path of adept advancement, and as a first-grade goblin adept, he had a lifespan of over a hundred years. In addition to that, all the magical rituals he had conducted had allowed him to maximize his lifespan. Still, even that had only barely given him 170 years to live. After all these years of aging, he only had 20 years left. 20 years. It might sound long, but it was a blink of the eye from the perspective of adepts. As such, Snorlax had been searching for resources or methods that could fundamentally change his lifespan limit over the past few years. The bloodline recreation potions that had appeared in the clan were undoubtedly the safest and most reliable means of doing so. Even though Snorlax prided himself as one of the veterans of the Crimson Clan, the difference between him and Grim had only increased throughout the years as Grim continued to improve relentlessly. Snorlax now had great difficulty joining the decision-makers of the clan in their deliberations and meetings. Most of the time, it was incredibly difficult for him even to get an audience with Grim. The other goblin leaders were facing a similar situation as Snorlax. Commander of the goblin machinist sorcerer composed Brutal Blood Army, Drusilla Larsal, was now 48 years old. Converted into human years, he was an elderly man at the ripe age of a hundred years. Magical goblin leader Dean Gonga was 73 years old this year and had far exceeded the lifespan limit of an ordinary goblin. However, no one knew how much longer his magic-infused body would be able to support him. Goblin War God Tigul was four to five years old now. He was almost the youngest among the goblin higher-ups. With his status and position, extending his life for another 10 to 20 years would not be a significant problem. However, even if he were to use the best and most costly life extension ceremonies, he would not be able to live for more than another hundred years. Consequently, the extension of his life was also a major point of concern for him. While the goblin leaders whispered amongst themselves in a corner of the hall, commotion stirred at the entrance. The rising star of the Crimson Clan, Core Adept Merrill, had stepped into the hall surrounded by a group of adepts. Having experienced the nourishment of her new bloodline and the war over the past few years, Merrill had left her aura of gentle elegance in the past. She now appeared much more dignified and intimidating. The dragon skin armor she wore had been treated and tailored with meticulous care. It fit her youthful and fiery figure completely showing the beauty of her curves and her perfect body. The ferocious and savage aura of the fire dragon's bloodline had caused her form to become even more explosive and seductive. If it wasn't because of how well they knew her, Snorlax and the other goblins might have even mistaken her for another person. When Meryl strode into the lava hall with her chest held high, the temperature within the room very noticeably increased by five degrees. It was important to note that this was an underground lava hall over 200 meters below ground. A fearsome and roiling sea of lava lay right beneath the floorboards where they stood. As the Crimson Clan leader was a legendary fire adept, the temperature in the hall was maintained around 60 to 70 degrees Celsius to match the attribute for which the clan was known. Ordinary humans could not survive here at all. Even weaker individuals like Snorlax and Gonga could only move about freely in this place with the use of fire-resistance pendants and rings of cooling. 
Though most of the other adepts didn't enjoy such a warm environment smelling of sulfur, they were first grade adepts, enduring such temperatures was still nothing for them. Obviously, Meryl's bloodline was perfectly compatible with the environment here now that she had become a fire dragon adept. The compatibility of her aura had stimulated the fire elementium in the hall, causing it to become more lively and active. Snorlax and the others could see faint hints of sweat on the faces of the adepts around Meryl, despite the smiles on their faces. It was clear that they were having trouble enduring the fire energy that Meryl was radiating. It was impressive of them to not show any discomfort on their faces despite how unbearable it was. With the Crimson Clan's victory once again, the influence and size of the clan were due for yet another round of explosive growth. At this time, anyone that could obtain the favor of the clan's leadership would be able to get the best positions and jobs. It would certainly allow them to gain more power and influence quickly. As such, no adept was willing to leave Meryl's side, even though they were already screaming in agony on the inside. While everyone was gathered around Meryl and talking to each other, another wave of commotion came from the entrance of the hall. Several second grades of the clan started to walk into the room. The tall and ferocious dragonborn Zatcha. Tigul, who only reached up to Zatcha's calf. Bugger Depth Billies, who was always wrapped in a thick and heavy cloak. The two blood knights, Shorosh and Windsor. The three blood elves, Ayase, Lilia, and Spala. There was also split brain Giyu, who had remained in the clan after the war concluded. Their arrival caused the atmosphere of the banquet to become even more lively than before. Familiar adepts greeted each other, clinking cups as they toasted drinks. The entire banquet hall was filled with laughter, conversation, and praise for the great clan leader. Yet, in this joyous moment, the entrance suddenly fell silent. Everyone turned their heads to look at an adept striding into the hall. As they sensed the mysterious and unusual changes that had occurred to the adept, a fire blazed in their hearts, and their eyes gleamed with desire. Gargamel Chapter 1020 Clan Welfare Gargamel walked into the hall with the company of forest spirit Eva and and mystique Amelia. In all honesty, if it weren't for the accompaniment of the two women, no one would believe that this middle-aged adept was that famous crimson majordomo Gargamel. In the past, Gargamel had skin as wrinkled as ancient bark, dark circles around his eyes, a hooked nose, and only a fuzzy ring of hair on his bald head. The first impression he gave off was that he was sinister and sly. However, the Gargamel of the present stood straight, without any trace of a hunched back. His skin had also turned smooth and young again, though with a slight shade to it. Tiny jade-green scales that had yet to grow fully could faintly be seen on his skin. If Gargamel used to look like an elderly in his twilight years, then he now looked like a handsome, robust, middle-aged adept brimming with life and vigor. Everyone could clearly see that apart from the fine scales showing on his face and neck, Gargamel also had a pair of turquoise reptilian pupils in his eyes. A sinister and vicious aura radiated whenever his eyes darted about the room causing every adept looking at him to feel their hearts tremble ever so slightly. Gargamel's aura was still that of a first grade. However, it had already increased from advanced first grade to peak first grade. He was only one step away from second grade now. It had only been twelve days since the clan leader rewarded him with the potions, and he had already manifested some of the representational traits of his serpentine bloodline as well as advanced by a minor grade. It was proof that his compatibility with the bloodline was reasonably high. Fire Dragon Adept Meryl, another core member of the Crimson Clan, was the first to walk up to Gargamel upon his arrival. The other adepts knew well enough not to approach them at this moment. Instead, they scattered into the surroundings and gave the two core adepts the space to talk amongst themselves. However, Judging from their slightly twitching ears, they were very concerned about what the two core adepts were discussing. Congratulations, Gargamel. It seems like our clan will soon have yet another second-grade core fighting force. 
Meryl raised her glass and toasted to Gargamel with joy and excitement written on her face. Gargamel hastily picked up a glass of wine from a servant's tray nearby and finished everything in a single gulp. He then smiled and nodded, Thank you, Lady Meryl, for your concern. My current condition is excellent, but this is all but a gift from our clan leader. Indeed, indeed. We must work more closely together in the future if we have the opportunity. The two congratulated each other with fake smiles on their faces. The two women accompanying them couldn't help but roll their eyes over and over again. The Crimson Clan had now very clearly split into the two different branches in the Northern Lands and Gentarim. They were not only located in different places but faced different enemies, different environments, and took different paths of development. As part of the Crimson Clan, both of these branches should be aiding and reinforcing each other. However, as the Crimson Clan gradually grew stronger, the competition between the two branches would only become more and more prominent. Grim's original intention was to avoid putting all his eggs in one basket and losing it all in a single fight. However, at this point, no one knew if the Crimson Clan's development henceforth should be centered around the Northern Lands or Gentrum. Debates on this had already occurred countless times within the clan. Both regions had their advantages and disadvantages, making it difficult to decide which was superior. However, with the eruption of war at the Gentrum branch, they had once again become the focus around which the clan's authority and resources revolved, it unavoidably stole some of the limelight from the northern lands. Moreover, with their victory in the Adept War, the Gentrum branch would be greeting an unprecedented tide of development. In doing so, they would indirectly suppress the growth of the Northern Lands branch to some extent. It wasn't hard to imagine that most of the Crimson Clan's resources and human resources would be invested in the Aelovis region for the next 10 to 20 years. That indirectly strengthened the authority and power in Gargamel's hands. Supposedly, both branches belong to the same clan, and there should be no reason for hard feelings. However, for the more opportunistic neutral factions within the clan, investing in Gargamel's faction at the moment would undoubtedly yield higher returns than Meryl's faction. That was the difference. If Meryl and Gargamel had some degree of comradeship between them, all of that insignificant relationship had now become smoke in the past. They were having a lively conversation when they were together, but the competition and contest of ability behind the scenes had never stopped. While the two of them were talking, the gates of the Adept Tower slowly opened. The third grade Adepts that truly represented the foundation of the Crimson Clan's power walked out and appeared in front of everyone. Naturally, at the very front was Grim, dressed in a large red robe. Compared to before, the overwhelming fire aura that Grim radiated was much more contained now. His dark red hair had also returned to its original black. Grim's tall and muscular body caused him to emanate a suffocating sense of power. Most of the first and second grade adepts in the hall had to avert their eyes to ease the pain when they looked upon the translucent barrier of flames around him. Now that he was close to peak third grade, Grim was like a mobile, humanoid volcano. Though the violent and contained fire energies in his body didn't erupt furiously, he could still inspire fear in every living thing around him. It was a fear that came from the depths of one's soul. It wasn't quite fear, nor cowardice. It was merely the instinctual reaction of a weak animal sensing an unknown danger. With Grim's current spiritual pressure and the fire force field that lingered around him, any apprentice adept that came within a hundred meters of him would face unpredictable danger. As for mortals, they had best stay as far away as they could if they didn't have the courage to jump into a sea of lava. Even the adepts could not stare at him directly. They could only glance at the translucent flames around Grim out of the corner of their eyes. If they stared at the fire too long, their eyes could be scalded. Only the few second-grade adepts in the room could barely shield their eyes with magical energy and look directly at Grim. However, all they could see was a human-shaped blaze burning furiously. 
They could not see through the force field of fire to look upon Green's face. When Green appeared, all the adepts in the lava hall immediately stopped their conversation and socializing. They turned towards him, placed their hands on their chest, and bowed. Hail, clan leader! Hail, clan leader! Greetings rang out throughout the hall, the passion and admiration behind the words were clear and distinct. Frankly, the reason the Crimson Clan could develop to its current scale could all be attributed to Green. Even though little things added up and the lower-level adepts contributed to the clan, what decided the status and position of an adept force was ultimately the power of the adept that stood at the center of the clan's authority. Without Green, the Crimson Clan would not have won the war, regardless of how many third grades they possessed. They would have been picked apart one by one by the fourth grade body refining adept, and the clan would have been captured in one fell swoop. Without Green's coordination and commands, the fourth grade magical golem dragon would have had trouble stopping adept Declan from breaking into its gaps alone. It was Green's existence that concealed the golem dragon's weakness of slow movements and attacks. It was his presence that allowed them to force the fourth grade body refining adept into a disadvantageous situation to play a game of endurance and exhaustion. Naturally, the result of such an exchange was incredibly tragic for Declan. In all honesty, the endless supply of magical energy from the magic generator furnace inside the golem dragon was occult knowledge beyond the comprehension and understanding of an ordinary adept. It was only in the highest archives of the Silver Union that one might perhaps be able to find similar perpetual magical machines. It was only with such a thing that Green could fully unleash the advantage of owning a goblin plane and its massive reserves of metal ore. Without the magic generator furnaces, the Crimson Clan would not have enough resources to support such a massive army of magical machines, let alone bring to life these war machines that should only exist on paper. If the Crimson Clan were to lose the large number of magical machines that functioned as the base level fighters of the clan, it would instantly be reduced to its weak, former self. The clan only had less than a hundred clan adepts. It was not enough number or power to prop up a fourth grade organization. If it weren't for the significant number of magical machines and goblin machinist sorcerers charging at the front lines in place of the clan adepts, this number of adepts would not last more than two or three wars. One could frankly claim that it was the shocking number of magical machines that was holding the lines for the Crimson Clan. They were the ones who forged this mighty empire for the clan. Following closely behind Green were Fate Witch Alice, Bloody Queen Mary, Magic-Breaking Assassin Olivan, Spirit of Pestilence Remy, Arms, and Iratina. The Elementium Magical Machine and the Old Poison which were only third-grade magical constructs and could not be listed as official adepts of the Crimson Clan. As the Crimson Adepts looked upon the various third-grade adepts of the clan and the foreign elders that represented its future, they once again felt the bright and vast future that awaited them. Everyone smiled. For the clan. For the future. For our ambitions. With his current lifeform grade, Green didn't have much to talk about with these small fries before him. After toasting three drinks to the clan, Green immediately returned to the higher levels of the tower. However, Alice and Mary did not leave. Instead, they started announcing the internal rewards that would be given to the clan adepts who had performed the best and made the most contributions during the war. Serpentine Bloodline Recreation Potion Bloodline Purification Potion, Mask of Petrification, Grail of Purification, Armor of Invigoration, Mechanical Heart, Abyssal Staff, Philosopher's Stone. A series of unfamiliar and strange names were announced. Even though no one knew their specific effects yet, the fact that they were third-grade items alone was enough to drive the Crimson Adepts insane. Apart from the third-grade items that made the Adepts writhe in excitement, the clan was also offering plenty of first and second grade items, spanning everything from magical equipment to potions, scrolls, wands, and even knowledge. All of these were up for clan members to redeem with their points. They only needed to exchange the contribution points they had obtained through the war.
and they would be able to purchase the high-grade items that they pined for.